Tech bros might just be the most insufferable people in the entire world. They really think they know better than everyone else. Whether you're Mark Zuckerberg thinking that you know what information people should and shouldn't get access to, or you're Jeff Bezos deciding what people should and shouldn't be able to buy, the tech bro hubris just knows no limits. And at the Republican National Convention last week, we got to see a tech bro buy his way in and give his hot takes on Ukraine. We're going to take a look at just what tech bro Dave Sachs has to say about the Ukraine conflict, something that he has appointed himself an expert in, which obviously is someone who uh, founded a a competitor to Slack. Uh, He is an absolute uh, true expert in. Um, We're going to see what he has to say, and I'm going to break down just what he gets wrong. But hint, it's basically everything. Let's go. On fire. Okay, so I'm skipping ahead through the part where he says Donald Trump is is, uh, awesome, uh, ignoring the fact that on previous episodes of his podcast, he called Donald Trump an idiot, right? Now, I'm not, again, this is not a political channel, uh, so I'm not going to tell you what to think, but if somebody goes in the course of like three months from calling someone a complete unintelligent buffoon and a fool and someone eminently unqualified to be president, all things Dave Sachs has said, and then flips all the way to the other side and says Donald Trump is the strongest, best president of all time, that should tell you the level of integrity with which this person is operating and that you should weigh his other words with the same level of conviction. Under President Trump, and they lit it on fire. Okay, uh, credit where credit's due. He's, he's not wrong, right? Uh, uh, you know, under Trump, there was a, um, the U.S. was still in Afghanistan, uh, but he had signed a, a peace agreement with the Taliban. Um, there, Russia had not yet invaded Ukraine. Um and of course, uh, Israel had not yet invaded the Gaza Strip. So, and Hamas had not yet attacked Israel. So, all of those things may well be true. It's not clear how much of those were attributable to the Biden administration. Um, as we point out, right, uh, Russia had been sort of working to push back or counter uh, U.S. aid to Ukraine for some time, right? And an invasion is not something that you do in the course of a couple of months or even uh, a couple of years. Generally, these things, large military operations, are planned for 12 months to 18 months or more. So uh, to sit there and say that, um, you know, everything before an administration was good and everything after it was bad it is not intrinsically true, especially when you're talking about third party actors like Iran, like uh, Israel, like Hamas, like Russia. First, President Biden botched the Afghanistan withdrawal, displaying incompetence and weakness for the whole world to see. Then. OK. In this, he and I are in agreement. This withdrawal was totally botched and an absolute disaster. And it's always funny to see the president uh, try to defend this one um, because even the defense is like, well, we got a lot of people out, but we had no idea who those people were. And a lot of U.S. citizens got left behind, which is like classic, a classic move of a botched withdrawal. He provoked, yes, provoked the Russians to invade Ukraine with talk of NATO expansion. Okay. Okay. This is something he has claimed repeatedly and is incredibly annoying because it is unbelievably wrong. And here's the thing, guys. Putin himself agrees that it's wrong. They say, oh, Tucker Carlson asked in a video, he says, why did you invade Ukraine? Right. When Tucker Carlson interviewed him in English. So Putin's talking directly to the American public. They say, well, what was the trigger of this conflict? He's, and Putin says, well, initially it was he calls it a coup. It was the change in regime when Russian backed President Viktor Yanukovych was outed. Right. And then he was ousted and. As you guys know, basically within days of Yanukovych's ouster, um, separatists in Crimea and the Donbas declared themselves independent. 
of Ukraine, declared themselves breakaway republics. And Putin, again, Putin backed this breakaway effort, but he never has officially acknowledged it. So what he says, he does a little bit of a reframing and he says, why did this new government, this this post Yanukovych government threaten Crimea, i.e. say, hey, you can't be a breakaway republic. Why did they try to bring the Don- fight the separatists in the Donbass? This I do not understand. And then he says, this is exactly what the miscalculation is. He, he argues the CIA was the ones who actually ousted Yanukovych. Um, and he says, you could have done this legally without victims, without military action, without losing Crimea. Uh, that is just a classic Putin uh, switcheroo, reverse victim and offender is the term, in which, again, separatists backed by Russia, declared the Donbas and Crimea separate countries. And Ukraine's decision to say, no, you can't just leave the country whenever you want, that Putin views as an act of aggression. But you notice what isn't anywhere in this statement. Anywhere in his, he had this opportunity. Nowhere does he reference NATO. In fact, in the first question Carlson asks in his interview, He asks, he says, Putin, you said that that the United States through NATO, you had prior to the invasion might, quote, launch a, quote, surprise attack on our country. Putin's referencing a surprise attack on Russia. And Tucker Carlson asks, tell us why you believe the United States might strike Russia out of the blue. How did you conclude that? Right. And then Putin says, I never said that. He did say it, and he he says that's preposterous. They, that we're not even a serious conversation. And then Putin spends thirty five minutes talking about Russian history, and we think that that's might have been like an accident or distraction. But he had an opportunity to sit there and go, if it was NATO expansion, then say it. Be like NATO's continued expansion. Because here's the thing: you're Putin. Let's say it really was about NATO expansion. Wouldn't you want? To make it clear that NATO expansion was the cause. And what I mean by that is, if NATO doesn't know that that was what they did to incur the invasion, then how do they know not to do it next time, right? Imagine you have a child or a dog and you punish them for a behavior, but you at no point associate or link the the bad behavior with the punishment. The punishment shows up a random time much after the behavior has ended. You, you, you have no idea. And you never acknowledge it in any way that that's why the punishment happened. How can you expect the behavior to change? So the fact that Putin hasn't come out and said, NATO, if you, the reason this happened is because we had an agreement and you have botched it, or you were never supposed to expand within our borders. And anytime you expand within our borders, we believe we have the right to defend ourselves and you can't do this again or else we're going to invade again. That would achieve the deterrent effect if that was Putin's objective. But here's where things are interesting. Here's what Dave Sachs just refuses to understand when he talks about provocation. Putin does actually believe that he was provoked into this and that he believes that the Ukrainians were attacking Russia, but not the Russian state, right? Not the Russia that appears on your map and my map, but something else, a Russian world, the Rusky Mir. And the Rusky Mir is Putin's expansionist vision of all Russians around the world. Right. In 2007, this is not a new project. In 2007, Putin created the Rusky Mir Foundation. This was to promote the Russian speaking world. It's a uh, what they call a revanchist idea. Right. Which means reversing territorial losses of a country, the restoration of imperial Russia and exerting influence over all Russian speaking peoples. And as we know. The individuals who identify most strongly with the Russian-speaking world are, in fact, in eastern Ukraine. 
That's where the most Russian speakers are. And so Putin sits there and goes, well, yeah, if, if Ukraine, when this new government said, hey, you cannot just set, you cannot just declare yourselves a separate country and merge with Russia, that to Putin was an attack not on the Russian state, but on the Rusky Mir. And Putin explicitly says this. He said, he's, he said in a speech just a couple months ago, he said the West is trying to tear apart Russia, but he defines Russia in that speech as, quote, historical Russia, which he argues that Ukrainians and Russians are one people, meaning that he thinks Ukrainians are just Russians who are confused, Right? So he says, we're acting in the right direction, protecting our national interests, the interests of our citizens and our people, right? And so the fact that Putin's out there and he is framing it this way, but to, to those of us with a brain, right, the vast majority of Ukrainians, like 90% of Ukrainians do not want to be part of Russia. They consider themselves a separate people with a separate language, a separate identity and a separate flag. The fact that Ukrainians don't want to be part of Putin's creepy rusky mirror is a, an ancillary problem for someone like Putin. And the fact is that only if you are an uncritical tech bro with no international or foreign policy qualifications, then you would absolutely take this at face value. When Putin says, I thought Russia was about to be attacked, and the asterisk, Russia refers to the best people. The people who the Kremlin needs to protect. Sure, there might be Ukrainian-born citizens with Ukrainian passports, but they're really Russian. And we have to defend those Russians everywhere. And I point this out because, again, we can go even deeper. But let's take a look at, let's circle back to what old Dave Sachs has to say about this. One, I want to point out the reaction here, too. As we've talked about, huge portions of the U.S. public uh, don't like Russia and think pretty highly of Ukraine and like to see the Ukrainians smack the Russians. They can correctly identify Putin as a maniacal dictator and the Ukrainians as having a right to defend themselves. So you notice, listen to the applause here. Attention. There were even some boos. And you saw that flash for a second? Wait, 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 wait. The fact that they flashed it means there was a cut. Might have been just me. Wait, I think there it was. Let's try it again. Afterward, he rejected every opportunity for peace in Ukraine including a deal to end the war just two months after it broke out. And that may have been true. The problem is there was the Joe Biden and the administration was not a party to that war. The only two people who were parties to it were the Ukrainians. And the fact is that if you look at the battle lines, Two months after the war started, that was actually the apex of Russian advances. And so to sit there and go, oh, well, the Ukrainians should have just given up when Russia was miles from Kiev. That is preposterous. And it's not crazy for the Ukrainians to sit there and be like, listen, we are finally pushing the Russians back. Right. And so why would they sign a deal? They have every right to refuse a deal especially given the fact that they were finally starting to drive the Russians back. So to sit there and be like, oh, Biden, you could have ended the war. It's like, dude, the Ukrainians were like, we could beat them. If you guys give us aid, we can beat them and kick them out of our country. And the U.S. was like, yeah, we think you can. And by and large, by the way, guys, they've been, they were right. Like, we forget this because the lines have been stalemated for a long time. Everywhere that is light green is areas that at one point Russia occupied, right? In, since 2020. So you can see 
They were forced out of Kiev. They were forced out of all these regions here near Sumy. They were forced out of Kharkiv. They were forced out of Kherson. And it's true. So in the subsequent 12 months after Putin tried to get them to sign a, 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 a effectively a hostage negotiation level deal, the Ukrainians pushed the Russians way back out of this country. So again, to sit there and be like, there was a peace deal, but Joe Biden didn't want it, is sort of stupid. If you're like, hey, Zelensky should have just given the Russians all that. They should have just let him have it. And remember, too, the other problem with a peace deal with Russia, with Putin, is that it's not worth anything. Right? This is really quite important. First off, in 1994, the Ukrainians gave up their nuclear weapons in exchange for a guarantee of sovereignty, a guarantee that Russia would never invade them, ever, no matter what. So that, that guarantee, that agreement that was signed by Russia, not by the Soviet Union, by Russia, Putin crumpled that up and threw it in the trash. So it's fair to say an agreement with Putin isn't worth a ton, right? Putin's also thrown a bunch of arms control agreements in the trash, unilaterally withdrawing after violating the hell out of them, right? And he says, well, Ukraine's NATO membership pushed them to do it. But again, as we talked about, this is Putin has said it's not about Ukrainian NATO membership. And, oh yeah, Ukrainian NATO membership by the way, has been just around the corner since 2008. So why then was there six years where this wasn't a problem for Putin? Then another, then in 2014, right, he annexed Crimea and the Donbass. And then there was nothing else, right? You can see, here's the agreement from 2008. 2008, they say, NATO welcomes Ukraine and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership. Both these countries will become members of NATO, timetable to be determined. But we got to see, they literally say, we got to see some democratic reforms in Ukraine and Georgia and some free and fair parliamentary elections. There's not even a membership action plan. And so NATO leaders, yeah, in 2021, they said the same thing, that nothing has changed in, in what's that, 10, 15 years from the Bucharest agreement that Ukraine would eventually join NATO, that should have been a clue to Putin that if NATO is saying the same things about you're almost there, dudes, you're, you're, you're ready, that should have been a clue to Putin that there's not actually a lot of movement and that NATO likely actually is being deterred by Russia, that NATO is not going to bring Ukraine in. Because again, as they pointed out repeatedly, the fact that Ukraine doesn't control all of its territory alone should stop it from becoming a NATO member. And with Russian aligned countries within NATO, like Viktor Orban's Hungary, as long as Putin can exert influence over one of those countries, which he does quite easily, any one of those countries will likely block Russian or Ukrainian membership because of their Russian affiliation. So, why would Putin invade if he had cheaper options to stop the thing from happening? The thing that really, frankly, wasn't happening. Again, zero progress from 2008 to 2021 should have told Putin that if Ukraine's membership is on its way, it's happening at a glacial pace. And even stranger still is that you may notice that there's been a few new NATO countries namely the Nordics, who are now directly on Russia's borders. But when that happened, why didn't Russia invade them? Isn't it comparably problematic for Russia, having a Nordic country on their borders? Well, the answer, the reason he's mad that Ukraine allegedly was coming closer to NATO, but not the, the Nordic countries, is because the Nordics aren't part of the Rusky Mir. Only Ukraine is the thing he wants to annex. So it's not about NATO. It's about annexing more territory. And again, it's very easy to look at Putin's actual statements. But if you only get your information from Twitter 
as we know Dave Sachs does, because he's just a podcaster tech bro, and he doesn't look into primary sources, he doesn't have actual historical context, he hasn't spent two years, as I have, in a top-tier international relations master's program, he can't read things below the surface. He doesn't understand how to read a statement from a politician, right? Because he's not. He's a tech bro. Now the war is deep into its third year with no end in sight. Hundreds of thousands of people are... Also a intriguing question, because you would think that Putin now would uh, say, hey, listen, just guarantee that the Ukrainians don't become NATO members and we'll pack our bags and go home. But that's not what he said. When asked about peace conditions, right? When asked about peace conditions after Viktor Orban's visit, what did Putin say? You guys might recall, uh, Putin said that he is not interested in a ceasefire. Very, very strange. Let's see if we can find the exact words that Putin used here. Right? Putin, after this trip, he said, quote, we don't expect anything. He said, maybe it can be useful. But after this visit, Putin, right, <laughs> in a leaked letter to the European Council, Orban said Putin was, quote, ready to consider any ceasefire proposal that does not serve the hidden relocation and reorganization of Ukrainian forces. And as we know, as he said publicly, that would involve eliminating or the permanent um, disarmament of Ukraine. The Ukrainian armed forces would have to dissolve before a ceasefire, not a peace negotiation, a ceasefire could begin. Is that the negotiating tactic of someone who just wants a guarantee that Ukraine won't become a NATO member? Why would he want a ceasefire that, again, ensures the U Ukrainian military ceases to exist? Why, why would you not simply say, I've proven my point. Ukraine cannot become a NATO member. Why would you not simply say, give us that guarantee and we'll be good? Why suddenly play this incredibly hardball negotiations in the face of what, when your own objectives, and why would you not simply try to achieve your objective of ending NATO expansion? Are dead. Hundreds of billions of our taxpayer dollars have gone up in smoke. Okay, I want to point out again that the the national defense of the United States; those weapons were made to 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 kill the armies of America's enemies. And Putin, who has repeatedly, explicitly said, I'm like, a, I'm, I am a poll against the United States. The fact that those weapons are going to kill Russians who are trying to conquer a U.S. ally is not sending them up in smoke. It's doing what they were paid to do. That's like saying you bought a car to drive to work and you go, wow, you put... You put $25,000 up in smoke. And by the way, guys, to calibrate this, um, if you make $100,000 a year, the U.S. has spent 0.2% of its GDP on this. So it's the equivalent of you spending $300. The U.S. has spent the equivalent of earning six figures and dropping 300 bucks to aid Ukraine. And with that $300 investment, they have pushed the Russians, attrited the Russian military to a nub. President Biden sold us this new forever war by promising it would weaken Russia and strengthen America. Well, how does that look today? Russia's military is bigger than before. Well, this is a classic example, again, of a, of a Twitter bro not understanding things. Russia's current military is indeed very large in terms of numbers, but their ability to conduct any kind of war other than a creeping attritional invasion is extremely limited, right? And in the process, it's 
bankrupting the Russian military. As we've talked about, the Russian government is spending a third of its budget just on this military operation. They are recruiting fighters, giving them minimal training, deploying them to the front lines, oftentimes with gear made in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And I point this out because, yes, this military is very effective at doing one thing, which is fighting trench warfare in eastern Ukraine. But what Russia doesn't have is a military that can fly overseas to Africa and shore up an, an, a, an ally under, under siege. They, would, they are currently going toe-to-toe, again, with an army of Ukrainian volunteers, conscripts, um, equipped with leftover Western weapons. This Russian military has more bodies, but make no mistake, it is incredibly comically weakened. An army of drunks and riding around in T-72s at best, T-54s at worst, with AK, AKMs from the 60s, this is not a a world beating military and the fact he knows this he knows that this is like saying the north koreans have a large and capable military they have a large military and in some ways it has capacity right but it is not for example we do not lose sleep over the north korean military uh rolling across east asia we don't lose sleep about the north korean military invading japan for example because they are so poorly trained so ill-equipped that mostly they spend huge portions of their resources just trying to function the russian military again not that different very effective i do not dismiss them but they are purpose-built for one thing, and that is trench warfare in Ukraine. But if they had to do anything else, they would utterly fall to pieces. And remember, a lot of the Russians, like an infantry conscript is easy to get, but you know what's hard to get? A pilot. A pilot takes three years to get them to where they're combat ready. They're ready to fly combat missions. Russia's lost a lot of their pilots. Their whole professional airborne corps Nobody, almost nobody in the Russian military can perform an airborne jump, an airborne operation. That's, that's a huge loss of capacity, right? The Russian military has some things that it, it maintains, right? It has great air defenses, no doubt about it. But those air defenses are not going to stop a stealth fighter. So you see how the Russian military is bigger, but it is way, 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 way worse. Our own stockpiles are dangerously depleted. Okay, well, how, okay, what's the problem? Is the problem that you didn't spend enough on the military or that you spent too much? And again, they're not dangerously depleted because who is going to use them? Who's going to, who are they meant to be used on? Now, I, I think there's actually some truth to this, right? The U.S. needs a large enough arsenal that China knows that no matter how much we give to uh, Ukraine, that we have enough in our in our bandoliers to uh, fight the Chinese in Taiwan. And we're working on that. But again, to sit there and be like, to be like, we are eliminating a threat that demanded we have enough resources, troops and brigades and bullets and ammunition we have maintained enough to fight the Chinese and the Russians and a regional war, right? That's the military's current positioning. And so the fact is that we don't really have to worry about fighting the Russians because the Ukrainians are doing it for peanuts. So now all we have to worry about is the Chinese. So even if our stocks were depleted by half, we'd still come out on top. But again, this is something that a tech bro, an aging tech bro trying to get named as like SecDef or, or, or Secretary of State or something, is just not going to get. Every day, there are new calls for escalation, and the world looks on in horror as Joe Biden's demented policy takes us to the brink of World War III. Okay. Every day, there's new calls for escalation. I'm going to let you know that, again, a response is not 
an escalation. These things are one, different, two, most of these things are not escalations, okay? Continuing to aid Ukraine at its current levels with the current set of equipment, not an escalation, okay? Again, send it, are they getting stealth fighter jets? No. Are they getting American combat brigades? No. Are they getting American air support? No. The escalation, for example, is generally logically predictable, controlled responses to specific deliberate acts by Putin. As we've talked about, was it, would you characterize it as an escalation for Putin to open a whole new front in the war? Wouldn't that be escalatory? And what do you think Putin's response would be, again, when clearly exploiting existing U.S. policy? Right? Putin knew U.S. policy was don't use weapons in Russia. And instead of saying, listen, it'd be a dangerous escalation, maybe Putin. Why doesn't Putin have any responsibility to prevent dangerous escalations? Why doesn't Xi from China have a responsibility to prevent Putin from making a dangerous escalation? Right? Doesn't Putin have a great have an incentive to not escalate? The answer is, of course, this is because it's a right. It's a, a Russian propaganda talking point that when Putin does it, it's because he's backed into a corner because he's just trying to win the war. But when the U.S. does it, it's a dangerous escalation. And that's intentional. So was it a dangerous escalation when Putin massed troops just two kilometers over the border in Kharkiv? And then the Ukrainians had to sit there and just watch it happen. Then the Ukrainians had to yield a bunch of their own territory just so they could use U.S. weapons to fight the Russians. Wouldn't Putin have very logically predicted that that would only work once? That the U.S. would, of course, not allow this to happen a second time? Why wasn't that considered an escalation? Why was it only an escalation when the U.S. changed its policies in response to that specific and, and absolutely predictable act by Putin? Again, Putin is a sophisticated political actor. This is not going to confuse him to be like, oh, I thought we could mass our troops right over the border and then push in. Of course not. And so this kind of, this kind of logical nonsense is just insufferable. Again, Putin's like, they say, well, you're allowing Ukraine to, to strike into Russia. That's unprecedented. Guys, Russia's been hit with deep strikes for months now, right? And what escalations? Like, if, if it was really a red line, again, a true red line, Putin has communicated clearly. He has been explicit that an invasion attempt of the, the that would remove Russian territory, which conveniently suddenly is now his sovereign borders, or an attempt to overthrow him and his government would incur actual nuclear consequences, right? That is explicit. And that's what you want. You want to have an explicit nuclear policy. So the fact that he does a bunch of other shit that's like vague and confusing says he's not serious. If you're serious about a policy, if you're serious about escalation, you're not vague and confusing, right? Just like, just like NATO. NATO has said, listen, don't attack a NATO country. We will not hesitate to, to activate Article 5. Not, no confusion, no like, oh, I, it'd, be, it'd, be a, it'd be bad. There would be consequences if you were to attack a NATO country. No, they lay it out clearly so that Putin knows so there's no confusion. So the fact that Putin creates the confusion tells you that it's not actually, he's not actually worried about it happening. He just wants to scare the West. And listen to those boos, by the way. Even the Republicans don't aren't here rooting for Putin. Listen to the boos. And the listen, he got booed because they know Putin's a bad guy, right? Like you cannot bamboozle the Republican Party into thinking like, oh, maybe Putin's a good guy. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe Hamas are great. Maybe they're stellar folks too. You're not going to trick them, man. You can't go out there and spew a bunch of Russian talking points. The Middle East, 
America is now losing. And I don't care about the Middle East. I, I care, but I don't cover it on this channel because the odds of me getting demonetized are so great. But if you're interested in seeing some uncensored combat footage, of which there's a bunch, that drops twice a week on combatnews.com. That's my premium site. You want to become a member for sure. Uh, because again, it enables me to sit there and criticize anybody, right? Dave Zach's a pretty big podcaster, but I can sit there and talk shit because I know I have you guys covering my back, right? I can tell him that he's full of it, right? I don't have to koto to one political party or one major media outlet. Plus, if you become a member, not only do you support me and keep me independent, but you get access to, to twice a week. I drop uncensored combat footage, deep dive analyses, stuff fresh off the front lines. It lets us see inside the 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 fight in ukraine in a way that we just can't get anywhere else oh and if you want to support me even more become a lieutenant tier you'll get the you'll get access to submit questions to the weekly q a and you'll get the your name at the end of videos but if you really want to support me with the colonel tier that would be awesome you get the shout outs at the end of videos by name and all the other aspects of all the other membership so check it out combatvetnews.com link is in the description huge thank you to the Colonel tier members, including Martin Baum, Gregory Pace, Stuart Abel, Daniel Brown, James Ola, Chris Holmes, and Chris Gorch, Gorch, Gorsuch, and all the Lieutenant tier members. Could not do this without you guys. Please subscribe to the channel and like the video. It does make a difference to the YouTube algorithm, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers.